This is part nine, long-term assets, a going concern. We're going to do a little bit of a review here. We talked about early on how accounting is the language of business. Accounting is the language that we use to tell stories about companies in the business world. As storytellers, accountants possess the power to influence the thoughts and actions of others. As professionals, accountants must seek to use this power wisely and honestly. In attempting to learn a new language, we have to first start with the basics. Of first importance is vocabulary. We gotta learn what words mean. And as we know, the vocabulary of accounting are the elements. Second, we gotta study the grammar. How do we put words together to make sentences? And in accounting, our grammar is the principle uh, the, are the principles and assumptions that we follow. Now we've talked a decent amount about principles, right? We've learned about revenue recognition. We've learned about expense recognition. But we haven't really talked too much about assumptions. Elements, again, are the things we're going to measure and report to other people. The principles and assumptions we follow tell us how to measure and report the elements. Our elements, our grammar, the principles and assumptions of our language we call generally accepted accounting principles. And as we know, those principles today are set by the Financial Accounting Standards Board what we call the FASB. But as I mentioned, we haven't really spent a lot of time talking about assumptions. So there's a particular assumption that comes into play here, particularly related to Chapter 9, or Part 9. The continuation of an entity as a going concern is presumed as the basis for financial reporting unless and until the entity's liquidation becomes imminent. What does that mean? Well, this is what we call the going concern assumption. It's the assumption that we hold that says that we believe a company will be in existence far into the future. That it's not going to go out of business next year. This assumption that we hold allows us to classify our assets as current and long-term. And so if we have a piece of equipment like a point-of-sale system, a computer cash register system allows us to record sales. If we have this system that we purchased, we expect and intend to use it over multiple time periods. We expect that this system this piece of equipment will allow us to generate revenue or will help us in our pursuit of profit, right? In our pursuit of revenue over multiple years. And so we classify it as a long-term asset. We do not intend to turn this piece of equipment into cash within the next year, which is the definition of a current asset. And so this going concern assumption, this assumption that we're going to be in existence for a long time, it allows us to account for this piece of equipment as a long-term piece of equipment. And so long-term assets that we use in the operations of our business, we typically refer to as property, plant, and equipment, or what is often frequently called PP&E. Now, PP&E essentially means land, that's property, buildings, which is plant, could be many different kinds of buildings, but buildings, and equipment, obviously, which is equipment. These assets are usually classified as long-term assets, meaning that the company believes they will be assisting in the generation of revenue for multiple years. The company does not intend to convert these assets into cash within the next year. 
Sometimes these asset types are also called fixed assets. And I have some examples here. This is not an exhaustive list by any means, but these are some things we would classify within this category. Computers, servers, office buildings, uh, vehicles, whether they're delivery vehicles or service vehicles or whatever, office equipment, machinery in a factory, furniture in an office building uh, or in a school, factories, okay? There are lots of different kinds of long-term assets. When we're concerned with these, we have to think about three things. We have to think about accounting for their acquisition, which means uh, when we purchase them or construct them. Two, when we use them over those multiple years of time that we expect to use them. And then we have to understand the accounting issues involved of their, in their disposal, so when we're done with them. In regard to acquisition, all costs to acquire the asset and prepare it for use are capitalized. Capitalizing costs means that they are recorded as an asset rather than an expense. When companies incur a cost, okay, when something costs them money, it can either be recorded as an asset or an expense. Assets, as we know, are recorded and put on the balance sheet. Expenses are uh, re uh, subtracted from revenues on our income statement. Correctly identifying the difference between whether to capitalize a cost or expense a cost is very important. If we capitalize a cost that should be expensed, then the expenses we report are lower than they should be, which means the profits that we report are higher than they should be. This has been done intentionally in the past by other companies, uh, by different companies, and it is considered financial statement fraud and can be a big deal. If you're interested in reading about something like this, look up the company WorldCom. WorldCom. And you'll find some stuff. All right. Let's say that Carl, our canoe uh, uh, entrepreneur, purchases five new canoe storage racks from Float Your Boat Equipment Company on January 1, 2027. The racks cost $600 each for a total of $3,000. Carl also pays Float Your Boat $400 to install the racks in his shop. So, what is this going to look like? We're going to record a debit to equipment for $3,400. The $3,000 is the cost of the merchandise, the cost of the equipment, the $400 that he paid to have the, these storage racks installed is a cost of preparing them for use, which is also capitalized. So we would credit cash of $3,400 and debit equipment of $3,400. So any cost to acquire or prepare an asset for use is capitalized. Now as we use them, we're going to run into two accounting issues. We're going to run into the issue that we have to abide by, which is called depreciation. And we're going to run into repairs and maintenance on most long-term equipment. Depreciation is allocating the cost of the asset to expense over its useful life. And the entry for depreciation, as we know uh, from previous video, is depreciation expense and accumulated depreciation. Now, we'll get into some more details with depreciation in a minute. However, as we have long-term assets, we are also likely to run into an issue related to repairs and maintenance. Now, ordinary repairs and maintenance, we just expense. So if I go buy um, for my car, uh, or I have a flat tire in my car, and I go and I have it plugged, I'm just going to expense that. Okay. I'm going to record repairs and maintenance expense. 
and cash. But if I have what is called an extraordinary repairs uh, repair, then I will capitalize that cost. Now, an extraordinary repair is one that either increases the life of the asset, makes it last longer than it originally would have lasted, or it adds some new benefit to the asset that we didn't have before. So if I have a delivery truck and I add a lift, a hydraulic uh, lift to the back of it to pick stuff up, that would be capitalized because it adds a benefit that it didn't have before. And so in that case, we would debit the equipment account uh, and credit cash. Okay. So if we have an extraordinary repair, we capitalize. And if we have an ordinary repair, we expense. So it's really important to understand uh, the difference between the two. Now when we get to disposal, once Carl is finished with using the storage racks and des desires to replace them, he will attempt to dispose of them. Disposal can take many different forms. Carl could sell the racks, he could scrap them, he could donate them, lots of different ways. Whatever the method, once the racks are gone, they need to be removed from the books. So I want to go back and do a little review of depreciation. Because we talked about depreciation earlier in a different video, we didn't get into the real specifics on how this works. Okay, And so depreciation in accounting is a cost allocation technique. It's not a valuation technique. Not really. Okay, We think of depreciation a lot in normal, everyday life as something losing its value. And that is a correct use of depreciation. But when we're looking at it in accounting, it's not quite like that. So let's say I have an asset that I'm going to use for six years, Okay, these storage racks. They cost me $3,400, as we just looked at. And they have a residual value, which means when I'm done, I think they'll be worth 400 So that is a little bit of a valuation piece here. But this whole process really doesn't have anything to do with trying to determine what an asset is worth. And we'll see how and why here in a second. So I have these storage racks. I bought them for 3400 I think they'll go last me for six years. And when I'm done, I might get 400 bucks out of them. Now the expense recognition principle, as we know, tells us to record expenses when they're incurred. Now we also call this the matching principle, which means expenses from January get matched to revenues from January, right? Expenses from February get matched to revenues from February. We put out effort in January. Our efforts get matched to our accomplishments from January. It's the matching principle. Now, when the benefits of an asset are used up, what does that mean here? What is the benefit to this asset? Well, this asset, this particular storage rack, is serving a purpose, right? It is allowing me to display the canoes so that people will come in and rent them, right? And take them out on the lake. Okay. So when the benefits of the asset are used up, we have to expense the cost of the asset. Now, we've done this multiple times. When we use up prepaid rent, we expense it through rent expense. When we use up supplies, we expense it through supplies expense. And when we use up the benefits of equipment, we debit depreciation expense. We credit an account that is a bit of an unusual kind of account. We've looked at this before. But it all goes back to this principle. Historical cost. This is the measurement principle in accounting where the dollar value of an asset on the balance sheet is based on its nominal or original cost when acquired by the company. So, when we buy supplies, we put the supplies on our books as an asset but when we use up the supplies, we expense the supplies, and we credit the asset account. Carl no longer has the supplies, 
So that's why he can credit the supplies account. The asset is gone. It's been used up. But in the situation of the storage racks or any other long-term asset, right? Carl still has the storage racks. He cannot credit the equipment account when he records depreciation expense because it is that storage racks, those storage racks on his books still have to be recorded at their historical cost. As a result, we use a contra asset account. And we know this contra asset account, as we talked about it in previous video, as accumulated depreciation. So, we're going to debit depreciation expense, we're going to credit depreciation, accumulated depreciation. But the question then now is how much? And we haven't done this before. We haven't, at this point in our video series, looked at how the numbers are figured out. So we're going to look at three different ways companies can determine the amount of expense to record for their long-term equipment. Straight line depreciation is the easiest method to use. It's the most widely used method. You determine the depreciation expense by taking the cost of the asset, subtracting the residual value or the value you think you will uh, get for it when you're done, and dividing it by the useful life. So in our case here, we would take the 3400, subtract the 400, and divide it by 6. This tells me my expense should be $500 per year. So each year, each of the six years, I'm going to record depreciation expense and accumulated depreciation of $500. I only have to do one calculation because this tells me how much to record per year and I go with that amount until something drastic changes. I'm going to use that $500 and record depreciation expense for the next six years. Now when I'm done, we'll take a look in a little bit of what that uh, will look like. But how does this affect my financial statements? My income statement would show depreciation expense of 500 bucks. My balance sheet will have equipment, 3400. I'm going to take out the accumulated depreciation of 500 and I'm going to have a net equipment amount of $2,900. That net equipment account amount is what we call book value. We call it book value because it's the value in the book right the general ledger that does not necessarily mean that someone would be willing to pay me twenty nine hundred dollars for this equipment that is not the market value or fair value of the equipment somebody might very well pay me thirty one hundred dollars for that uh, for these storage racks if I decided to sell them or maybe they only think they'll that would be worth $2,500. Again, we're not trying to determine here with depreciation what the asset has as a market value, what somebody would buy it for. We're just simply trying to allocate the 3400 across time. Expense it across the time the asset helps us generate revenue. We're trying to abide by the matching principle. Okay, second method, units of production. This method uh, is a little bit different, so I'm going to switch it up here and go with the canoes, okay? Uh, only because it will make a little more sense. So let's say that these were canoes instead of storage racks. In units of production, you first come up with a depreciation rate. You take cost, you subtract residual value, and you divide it by the estimated productive life. So what does that mean? So depreciation will be 3,400 cost minus residual of four, but we're going to divide it by the number of rentals we think the asset will help us to generate or will uh, serve us. So, like for example, if you had a vehicle, delivery vehicle, you would likely use the number of miles that you think that delivery vehicle will go, okay, or that you will use it. If you had a machine. Uh, that produced units. You could use the number of units you think the machine will produce over the life. Okay, so you're using their productive life, not their time life. Okay, 
So what this does is it gives us a rate. So we have 60 cents per rental. And so what we need to know for this year to determine depreciation expense is how many rentals. Okay, How many times did we rent it out? And so I just made up some numbers here. So 60 cents per rental, and let's say that we rented it out a thousand times during 2027. What would our depreciation expense be? It would be $600. 60 cents times a thousand rentals. So I would record $600 this year. Next year, I don't know, right? I'm not going to know what next year's depreciation expense will be until I know how many rentals, right, in 2028. Okay. In straight line, you know the number for every year at the very beginning. With units of production, we don't. Now, how does it look on our income statement? We would have depreciation expense of 600 and on the balance sheet, we would have a book value, under units of production in this case, of 2800 So again, depending on the method I choose, I'm going to have different book values. But these book values, again, to reiterate, are not how much someone would be willing to buy this from us. Right? That's not, that's not what it's talking about. It's not what it's trying to communicate to us. It's simply the amount we have left to expense. Right? That is listed there. All right, double declining depreciation. This one is what is called an accelerated depreciation method. It is different uh, than the other two. Depreciation expense under this method uh, is based on book value. So book value times a double declining rate. So a book value. What is book value? Well, we know book value is the cost of the asset minus accumulated depreciation. That is what tells us book value. The double declining rate is equal to 2 divided by the useful life. Okay, 2 over the useful life. And so in our example here, this is what the first year would look like. I like to make these tables. Uh, they're not a requirement, but setting up a table like this, as you'll see in a minute, makes it very easy to, to follow this method and not make mistakes. Or it makes it easier, uh, hopefully easier, to keep from making mistakes. So the year 2027, the cost is 3400 to start the year. At the beginning of the year, there is no depreciation. So the book value at the beginning of the year is $3,400. My double declining rate would be 2 over 6. So 2 over 6. And that's roughly 33.3333%. Okay, which means my expense for year one is one thousand one hundred and thirty-three dollars. So thirty-four hundred is the book value at the beginning. My double declining rate. That tells me my depreciation expense. So my entry would be one thousand one hundred and thirty-three dollars depreciation expense, and then a credit to accumulated depreciation of one thousand one hundred and thirty-three dollars. And again. I won't know year two until I do the next row in this table. So my income statement under double declining is going to have much higher value in the first year than the other two. There are going to be different expense amounts depending on the choice of method. On the balance sheet, I have a book value under straight line of 2900. I have a book value under units of production of 2800 and under double declining I have a book value of $2,267. So you're going to have different book values depending on the method that you choose. But eventually all three of these methods have to get us to the same place. And that same place is our residual value. When we are done depreciating this asset we have to have on our books a book value that is equal to the residual value, the value we think that's going to be left over at the end. So, for example here, straight line, 500 a year. So accumulated depreciation goes from 500 to 1,000 to 1,500 to 2,000 to 2,500 to 3,000. When we get to 2032, the book value is $400, which is equal to our residual value. 
under units of production. I made up some numbers here. But what happens is we take that depreciation rate multiplied by the number of rentals. So let's say we use it, we expect to use it 5,000 times. So 1,000 in year one, that's 600 bucks. 1,100 in year two, which brings accumulated depreciation, which is year one and year two, right, to 1,260. 1,500 rentals brings us to 2,160. 1,000 rentals brings us to 2,760. And then 400 rentals brings us to 400. So we actually get to the residual value or book value being 400 earlier than in straight line. And that's okay. Units of production is not based on number of days or years. It's based on productive life. So, But by the end, where are we at? We are at $400. Double declining takes a little more work. Okay. Double declining takes a little more work. So year one, we know it was 1,133. When we get to year two, the accumulated depreciation at the beginning of year two, 1,133, is equal to the accumulated depreciation at the end of year one, right? 1,133. And so our book value is 2,267 when we start year two. We multiply that times the rate, we get a new depreciation expense amount, which increases the depreciation we've accumulated by the end of that year. In year three, same thing, right? We have a book value at the beginning of 1511. We multiply it times the rate, we get $504 in expense, increases the accumulated depreciation, and so we have a new book value when we start the next year. The book value is $1,007. Multiplied by the rate, $336 in expense, and a book value or accumulated depreciation at the end of $2728. 2031, right? This is year one, two, three, four, five, right? Second to last year. We have a book value at the beginning of $672. We have expense of $224. And then our accumulated at the end is 2952. So before we get to year six, again remember, we have to end, right, with four hundred dollars as the book value. In order for there to be four thousand dollars four or four hundred dollars, sorry, as the book value, accumulated depreciation can only be how much? It can only be three thousand dollars. Well, if we look at our table here, we've already accumulated two thousand nine hundred and fifty two dollars in depreciation so how much more can we expense well we can only expense in this last year forty eight dollars so we just make it work forty eight bucks in the last year gives me three thousand dollars in accumulated which would give me then four hundred as a book value and what do you notice here about this method as I said it's called an accelerated depreciation method most of the depreciation happened in the beginning right every year after year one what happens it goes down 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 and smaller right we take most of the hit up front if we use this method and less of the hit later that is an accelerated depreciation method so Here's the three methods. Okay, where do they get us all at the end by 2032? All of the methods get us to 400. Do they get us to the 400 in the same way? No, they do not. Okay, no, they do not. But these methods, again, are not methods that are trying to determine what the asset is worth to outside people. They are simply trying, they're different ways to allocate right the thirty four hundred dollar cost across time now let's say that we use the straight line method and we're in year 2030 we're not yet to 2031 or 2032 we're just in the year 2030 we have the cost of 3400 we've accumulated two thousand in depreciation and our book value is fourteen hundred so at the very beginning of 2031 we decide to sell these storage racks. We decide to dispose of them. 
we're going to get rid of the equipment from our books. We're going to credit equipment for 3400 It's gone now. We're going to get rid of the accumulated depreciation, which is 2000 And let's say somebody decided to pay us 2200 for these storage racks. So we would debit cash for 2200 But if those are the only three things we do, we get rid of the equipment, the accumulated depreciation, add in the cash, we have a problem because this doesn't balance, right? We have 4,200 in debits and we have 3,400 in credits. We're missing some credit somewhere. So what do we have a credit for? Well, it's not a credit to assets. It's not a credit to liabilities. We don't owe anybody money. So it's got to be something related to equity. Nobody's invested more stock, so that's that's not it. So that means by default, we've got something in retained earnings here to use. Is it revenue? Well, revenue is a credit balance, but revenue represents the amount we charge people for goods and services. This doesn't really have anything to do with goods and services. We sold them storage racks that we've been using in our store. It's not a good or a service. It's not selling them paddles, right, that we normally would sell out of inventory. And the amount we charged them was 2200 And so if we use 2200 as the credit, that's not going to work. That's not going to make a balance. It's not expenses. There's no cost to us here. And it's certainly not dividends. And we didn't pay out to stockholders. So we have a problem because... We don't have an account that fits here. And that's because we haven't studied these accounts yet. So retained earnings, as we know, has revenue, expenses, and dividends. Three temporary accounts. But it also has, as sub-accounts, subcategory of accounts, two other kinds that we have yet to talk about. It has what we call gains and losses. Gains are increases in assets that happen, uh, that come about because of non-operating activities. So either investing activities or financing activities. Losses are decreases in assets that arise from non-operating activities. So again, either investing or financing, not operating. So in the case of our problem here, our assets went up by 2200 they went down by 3400 and they went up by 20 by 2000 when we removed the contra account accumulated depreciation so overall our assets went up by 800 bucks because of this we removed an asset that had a $1400 book value and got an asset that had a $2,200 book value. So, we have a gain on disposal of 800 bucks. $800. So, what do we do with this? We would credit gain on disposal for $800. And so, if I had received less than $1,400. If my uh, cash amount received was less than the book value of $1,400, then I would have a debit account to balance out my entry that would be loss on disposal. So again, gains represent increases in our assets overall from non-operating activities, and losses represent decreases in our assets from non-operating activities. Now, in summary, property, plant, and equipment, the accounting issues uh, are acquisition, use, and disposal. Acquisition, all costs incurred to acquire and prepare an asset for use, are capitalized. When we use an asset, companies allocate the cost of the assets long term to the accounting periods in which the assets assist the company in generating revenue. This process is called depreciation. Now, 
there are different ways we can do depreciation. Okay, we had three methods we looked at in this video. Disposal, when disposing of a long-term asset, it's likely companies will record gains or losses on the disposal. As always, remember, 